Last time we started section 1.1, Mathematics and Problem Solving, and we had done an example with patterns and a mathematician um, who was awfully bright little six-year-old um, named Gauss. And his problem that he had done was with adding up the numbers from 1 to 100, um, and he noticed that there was a pattern when he paired them up sort of in reverse order. And then we did a similar problem where we paired up numbers as again in reverse order, um, but they weren't starting at the number 1, and we noticed how we would change the process to accommodate that. And then we also talked about what would happen if the numbers skipped, like if it skipped from 2 to 4 to 6, or if it skipped every fifth number and so forth. So we're going to do another example now, um, and we're going to do this one with a strategy called examining a simpler case. So the question says, if a soccer league has 10 teams, and each team plays every other team once, how many games will the league manager need to schedule at the start of the season? This is a very practical question because he wants to make sure he has the umps or the refs. I don't know what, what they're refs in soccer, I should know that. Um, he needs to make sure he has the appropriate number of refs and so forth for the games that are scheduled, the fields reserved and whatnot. So the problem is that when you do this for 10, 10 teams, that's kind of a lot to be able to figure out what's going on. So we're going to simplify the case, and what we're going to look at is to consider three teams. And because I'm not super um, interested in writing a whole lot, I was going to say super creative, but I'm pretty creative. I just don't want to write very much. Our teams are A, B, C. Sound good? Make it easy. All right, so if we have three teams, A, B, and C, then team A needs to play team B. And team A needs to play team C. And team B needs to play team A. And team B needs to play team C. And team C needs to play team A. And team C needs to play team B. So these are all the possible groupings of the letters together. So it almost looks like the answer should be six games. But there's a problem with that answer. What's the problem? Right. As they're listed right now, everything's there twice, right? It's double counted. So there's double countings. So I actually don't need like this one, um, and I don't need this one, and I don't need this one. Half of them are unnecessary. But it almost looked like the answer would be six. So pretend with me for a moment and think about why would the answer have been six before we crossed things out? Why was it six? Do you know? Um, not quite. We are going to have to deal with the twice part in a minute, but not just yet. How do you get the number six when you started out with three teams? If you have three teams and you're playing the other two teams, then they cancel each other. That's right. Yeah, you're exactly right. So every team, and there are three of them, plays two games, right? So there are six is achieved because we did three times two. Three is our number of teams. And the two is the number of games per team. Okay, so does that make sense? That's where the six came from when we wrote them all out. But like we just said, we really shouldn't sort of have written them all out because that double counted everything, right? So in the end, in order to remove the double counts, we actually could do what? Divide it by two, right? It's really half of what I originally said. So if we were to take the three times two, because it's the number of games times the number of teams, and divide by two, our answer will be, of course, three. But it's the process that I care more about than the answer, because this really didn't answer my question. Right? My question had to do with 10 teams. But now that I've established where the six came from and the process, I should be able to replicate that for 10 teams. So if I have 10 teams, what would I have to do?
I don't want to write out A, B, C, D, and so forth ten times. That's not what I want to do. So what can I do? Okay, ten times nine. Okay, ten teams times nine. So why is it times nine? Yeah, there's nine opposing teams. They each are going to play nine games. And then what do I have to do? Divide by two. And why am I dividing by two? Because they'd be doubled. I'm removing the double counts. Same thing as it was with three teams. I just don't want to write out all the teams, A through whatever. So what happens when I multiply 10 times 9 and then I divide by 2? I get 45 games. Now, there, are, there is context to these problems, so there are units on all my answers. So 45 games. And if you weren't sure where the 3 times 2 came, or not the 3 times 2, but where the 6 comes from and it yields 3 at the end, could you do it for 4 teams? Yeah, I mean, it'd be more. I mean, I'd have to write out more than I just did, but could I write down 4 teams, A, B, C, D, and pair them all up and see what happens and see if I can notice a pattern from there? Yeah, it definitely could. So if one example is not enough to see what's happening in general, Try a couple of examples to see if you can figure out a pattern of what's happening in general. Okay? Okay. This one's one of my favorite ones. A store sells bicycles and tricycles. There are a total of 15 cycles in the store. And there are 35 wheels on those cycles. How many of each type of cycle are sold in the store? Now, you could do this problem with algebra. You could write equations and you could solve. And if you want to do that, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, except that it's kind of overkill. It's really not necessary for the particular problem we're working with. And this problem can be solved simpler and by much younger children if we don't go into algebra, right? Because I don't know about you, but my nine-year-old doesn't know algebra. But he could do this problem the way I'm gonna show you how to do it, and that's kind of cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw cycles. And we're going to draw them as bicycles to start with because all of our cycles have at least two wheels. A bicycle has two wheels. A tricycle has at least two wheels. Make sense? How many cycles do we have? Fifteen. So we're going to draw fifteen cycles. And I'm going to show you exactly the extent of my um, artistic ability right here. That's a bicycle. By definition today, that is my bicycle, okay? And I'm going to draw 15 of those. Okay, I have 15 cycles, but how many wheels do I have? I have 30. How many wheels am I supposed to have? 35. So what do I need to do? Add some. I need to add some. I need to turn some of these bicycles, quote unquote, into tricycles. How many wheels do I need to add? Five. So I'm going to add a third wheel to five of the cycles. If you thought my bicycles were cool, you're probably really loving my tricycles right now. Can I answer the question now? I can, and there's no numbers on my picture, by the way, about it, right? There, there aren't. So how many bicycles do I have? 10 bicycles. Ah. I there we go. And how many tricycles? Five tricycles. Okay, now, that's pretty cool, right? You can do that. Can a nine-year-old do that? Yeah, I think a nine-year-old can do that. So try to break out of the mindset that you've been trained up into so far with all the algebra you've done in high school 
but everything has to be turned into equations. Think a little bit more outside of the box. Problem solving is not about using traditional mathematics. It's still about using your brain to come up with a way to do something. And there's other options besides what you've seen. Think creatively. Okay? All right. I mentioned this last time as a legitimate strategy. Um, the Hang on. Did I skip one? Oh, no. It just doesn't have the right title at the front. This should say guess and check right here. Sorry. This is my mistake. Nothing to do with your papers at all. Although it could say make a diagram, because we're going to do that too. Um, I mentioned guess and check last time as being a legit problem-solving strategy, right? And um, I'm going to show you how it can be used in an appropriate way to achieve, achieve an answer that you need. So we have 48 feet of fencing, and we wish to make an enclosure along one side of an existing barn. What lengths would the sides need to be to have the greatest area enclosed for our chickens? So our chickens are apparently going to run in this enclosure, is the deal chicken run. All right, so um, a, a diagram is helpful to start with this, a picture of what's going on, namely a picture of a barn and a fence. Make sense? So I'm going to draw over here on the left-hand side of my page a barn. I didn't mean that. Let's try again. So here's my barn, and my barn is going to have a fence along the side of it, and when we draw our fences, we're going to draw them along the side of the barn, which means that the part that's along the barn itself does not need fencing. Make sense? Think about when you have a fence behind your house. Do you fence along the house itself? No. That would be a waste of your money, right? So the same is true for this. No fence along the side of the barn. So my fence is blue because that's the color I picked today. Blue fencing. Okay. Um, we're trying to figure out what the lengths and the widths would have to be for the sides of this barn to give us the most space. We want space for the chickens to run around. So like it could be more like a square or it could be more really really long and skinny and the question is which one gives us the best choice. Does that make sense? Now we are restricted by how much fencing we have. How much fencing does it say we have? Okay so we have 48 feet of fencing. Now, using the pictures that we've drawn so far, what do you have to figure, or what do you notice that will be a constraint upon the sides of your barn, or sides of your fence? For example, if I decide that this, this piece right here is going to be 10, what else do I know automatically? The bottom one is 10. So whatever is going on up here is going to go on down here, right? So two of my sides are going to be duplicated. Um, and then once I know two sides, based on the numbers I've picked, I should be able to figure out the third one. So let's just use 10 as the first guess that I have, and we're going to keep a record as we go. Guess and check is not super helpful unless you keep a record of your guessing and your checking. So one option is that I have two sides that are length 10, and if I do have two sides of length 10, what is the third side? 28, because they all have to add up to 48. At least it makes sense for them to. Otherwise, you've just got extra fence left over and you wasted your money too, right? You want to use all the fence. All right, so how then would I figure out, what, what am I checking for? What's my goal here? Area. What would I have to check to see, or how would I check to see what the area is of our fence right now, or our space inside our fence? Right, so area is length times width. So over here in my picture, my goal is to multiply the length times the width. So in my guessing, um, in my checking step, I'm going to be multiplying the length, 28, I'm sorry, 28, times my width, 10, which gives me 280 square feet. Now, we, we don't know if this is a good number or not. There's really no way of knowing yet, because we only did one, je one guess. So we need another guess. So pick me another top and bottom that match that's not 10. Five. So if we do five, let's see what happens. So I've got five and five. How much would be left for my third side? 38. Good. And then we need to check it by doing what? 38 times five. 38 times five. So grab your calculator if you don't have it out already and multiply. What is 38 times five? 190. So 
it kind of looks like, at least, that making the top and the bottom smaller maybe wasn't going to give us a bigger area. And we didn't know that until we tried it. So what do you want to guess next? We did 10, we did 5. What's next? 15. All right. So I have 15, 15, and what? 18. And then I'm going to multiply the 18 times the 15. Two seventy. Now, two seventy is not as much as my first guess, right? Not quite. But it's closer than the middle one was, right? So I did better by getting it bigger, but maybe it got too big. Is that possible? It's possible. So maybe now we use that information to say, okay, I went from two eighty to two seventy. I don't like the five in the middle. That one ended up being quite small. So I don't want to try something maybe smaller than 10, but maybe I still need to go bigger than 10, but not quite as big as 15. This is what you should be thinking as you're guessing. You know, what, what can I use this information to guess next? So what, what might we guess next? 12 or 13. Okay, let's guess 12. I heard that one first. So 12, 12, and what? It's 14, what's left? 24. You're close, 24. All right, so I have 12, 12, and 24. So now I'm going to have 24 times 12. What's 24 times 12 going to give me? 288. Is that more than I've had so far? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Do we know for sure yet? Is that the biggest one? Not really, but it's the biggest one so far. What do you want to guess next? 13. 13? So 13, 13, and 22. 13, 13, and 22. So now I have 22 times 13. What's that one? 286. Ooh, so we get just a tiny bit bigger, and my area actually went down. There's one more number I need to check before I can say for sure and certain that 12, 12, and 24 is my best choice. Any idea what it would be? Somebody said it. 11. I need to check 11 because it's on the other side of 12, right? So 11, 11, and 26. And then what is 26 times 11? 286. So again, slightly smaller gave me a slightly smaller area. Again, this one right here maximizes my area. Now, if you stop right there, you haven't exactly answered the question. I mean, you've done all the hard work, mind you, but you haven't actually answered the question. The question said, what lengths would the sides need to have, uh, need to be to have the greatest area enclosed? What, was, what lengths would our sides need to have? 12 feet, 12 feet, and 24 feet. That's our answer with units to this question. Okay, another sol problem solving strategy we're going to take a look at is called working backwards. One winter night, the temperature fell by 15 degrees between midnight and 5 a.m. By 9 a.m., the temperature numer temperature's numerical value had doubled from what it was at 5 a.m. By noon, it had risen another 10 degrees to 32 degrees. What was the temperature at midnight? So there's a lot of information here. Um, probably a good idea that we would make a list or kind of a little bit of a table of what's going on, right? And it's probably going to be chronological, right? What's happening in terms of the time of day? So we start with the time of the day being midnight. What's the next time of day it's referencing? 5 a.m. And then? 9 a.m. And then noon. 
And what we actually know is we actually know the final temperature. The final temperature is 32. Okay, so I'm going to put, oops, that was ex unfortunate. Okay. I'm kind of making a chart. Um, what do we know? So I've got kind of everything in here except for the how it's changing part. What do we know happened between midnight and 5 a.m.? So it went down 15 degrees. What happened between 5 and 9? It doubled, and I know the words kind of sound funny because it says that the numerical value doubled, but it doesn't really make sense for temperature to double because it depends on your scale you're looking at. If you're looking at degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, or degrees Kelvin, doubling would be different in different scales. So we, that's why the numerical value part's in there, just so you know. Um, what happens between 9 and noon? So it went up, right, 10 degrees. Now we're going to work our way backward using all that description. So we're going to start with the 32, and we're going to work our way back up the table. So if it's ended at 32, but it did that by going up 10 degrees, where was it before then? 22 degrees. And if it ended at 22 degrees by doubling, it would have been 11 degrees before that. And if it ended at 11 degrees by going down 15, it would have been 26 before that. So the answer to the question is actually 26 degrees. And I'm going to write in here just that it was at midnight for clarity, but you wouldn't have to necessarily write that. The answer is 26 degrees. Okay. I have one more bit to talk to you about because it's going to come up on your homework group. No, I think it's your group work, actually. And that has to do with the 12 days of Christmas. Um, so the 12 days of Christmas have actually, re they, they come from the religious symbolism um, that's here, okay? So you have a question in your homework or in your group work that talks about the 12 days of Christmas. And I want to make sure that you have written down um, what the 12 days of Christmas are because I don't know about you, but when I get far enough along in the song, I don't remember all of them quite as well. The early ones are no problem. I can get to about seven or eight, and I'm good to go. Once we get to nine, I tend to not have those as well. Because you don't see them as many times, right? No. Okay. So the first day of Christmas is the partridge in a pear tree. Right? And that first day, number one, symbolizes true, true love, which is God. Um, the second day of Christmas, you get two turtle doves. Um, the two turtle doves represent the Old and the New Testament. On the third day of Christmas, you get three French hens. And the three French hens are faith, hope, and love. The four calling birds on the fourth day of Christmas represent our four Gospels. And the five golden rings are the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. The six geese laying, six is the six days of creation. The seven swans of swimming is the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Our eight maids of milking is our eight beatitudes. The nine ladies dancing is the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Ten lords of leaping is the Ten Commandments. The eleven pipers piping is the eleven faithful apostles. And then the twelve drummers drumming is the twelve points of the doctrine in the Apostles' Creed. So, let me make one more comment about the particular question that's going to use the different, the different I wanted to say birds. There's so many birds in this description, but you know what I mean. Okay, the different gifts that are happening here on your 12 days of Christmas. What do you get on the fifth day of Christmas? Think about the song in your mind. What do you get? Okay, somebody say something. What do you get? Okay, say that really loud, Beth, because you're exactly right. Okay, so on the fifth day of Christmas, you don't just get the five golden rings, right? right? You get the five golden rings and the four calling birds and the three French hens and the two turtle doves and the partridge in a pear tree. So you get more than five gifts. Everybody clear on that? 
every now and then I have somebody who reads it and are like, oh, I didn't think that that's, that's not how I thought about the song. That is what the song is actually saying. So when it talks about asking you, like, how many gifts do you get on certain days and when, these kinds of things, keep that in mind. Okay? 